COVID-19 jabs are the most lucrative vaccines in history. Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna are making $1,000 every minute in profit, while the world's poorest countries remain largely unvaccinated. Should Big Pharma be cashing in on COVID vaccines after the huge investment governments have made? Good to have you with us. I'm Shuli Ghosh. More than 10 billion doses of COVID vaccines have been produced since the pandemic started, but only a small percentage were supplied to low-income countries. A recent report by Amnesty International says the global rollout of COVID vaccines was falling short as pharma giants prioritised wealthy countries and monopolised technology. According to Amnesty International, more than 1.2 billion people in low- and lower-middle-income countries could have been vaccinated by the end of 2021 if high-income countries and vaccine makers took their human rights obligations and responsibilities to heart. Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna supplied less than 2% of their vaccines to low-income countries, although their projected revenues last year were $54 billion. Distribution records for Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca show 50% of their stock reached low- and lower-middle-income countries. However, many of those doses were provided as donations from upper-income countries and not as part of sales agreements. The big pharma companies are still refusing to share their technology and intellectual property rights, despite a WHO initiative to help countries acquire vaccines at a fairer price. So let's introduce today's guests. In Brussels, Greg Perry, Assistant Director General of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. In Oxford, Moga Kamalyani, Senior Health Policy Advisor to the People Vaccine Alliance. And in Bath, Dr. Bharat Pankania, Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. Uh, good to have all of you with us. Um, Greg, I'm going to start with you because your organisation represents the, the big pharmaceuticals which have come in for so much criticism here, um, accused of monopolising drug manufacturing, putting profits before people's health, capitalising on a global crisis. What is the industry's response to this? Well, first, I'm not sure everyone shares quite that view uh, at all, but uh, we, we have been focusing on what is an unprecedented significant development of, of vaccines from uh, no vaccines for COVID, uh, you know, a year and a half ago to now a distribution of over uh, 10 billion uh, doses uh, worldwide. Uh, we know there are challenges in certain developing countries, which I'm glad to speak about before, uh, but this industry has been committed to ensuring that these products, and there are now a large number of these vaccines which are available um, and produced uh, to, be, to be available globally. Uh, we're committed to equitable access. Um, and we feel like, uh, you know, there's still more of a job to be done. Um, there are issues and challenges that I think we need to discuss well, which uh, relate to issues such as particularly around distribution. Right. So uh, the IFPMA's position is that there are enough vaccines to go around. There could be enough vaccines to go around um, with manufacturing being scaled up as it has. But the issue is distribution. So what is Big Pharma doing to address that challenge? Well, a number of things. The first thing is we, we have been, um, you know, working through COVAX, working on the ground uh, around distribution. And we have made it uh, very clear since since May of last year about the need to ensure that there is a proper uh, redistribution of vaccines that are produced by, by manufacturers. So that's one clear thing. Now, we've seen uh, improvements in COVAX uh, over recent much months, which we very much welcome. Um, but we, we must remember that COVAX um, was a new institution. It had a lot of teething problems. And between April and November of last year, um, the principal e exportation um, or availability to COVAX, uh, which would have been through the Serum Institute, was not uh, possible because of the export um, ban that took place in India for their own pandemic reasons. Um, and we have, and companies and governments have been trying to fill that gap. Now, of course, it's opening up, which is which is which is great news. Barrett, let me come to you. Uh, Greg mentioned COVAX which, of course, was the, the, the big distribution programme that was put in place for low-income countries to get vaccines. How has that been working? It could have worked better, but if I go back to what Greg Perry was saying, 
um, we mustn't forget what happened. And what happened is as follows. The European Union, United States, the affluent nations put in forward purchase orders for the vaccines. And guess what? The vaccine manufacturers took all those forward orders and sold the vaccines, or shall we say, uh, allowed the richer nations to buy them. And therefore, when the Africans went to the pharmaceutical companies, the Pfizer's, the Moderna's of this world, and said, can we have some? They were told, no forward orders. They've all been sold. So whilst they may be putting their, um, uh, their act in order now, today, we mustn't forget what they did. They, sh they sold all their forward orders to the highest bidders, and that's so unfortunate. They should have held back orders. They should have held back orders for Africa and other parts of the world. They should have allowed the other countries to also receive the vaccines at the same time as the United States, United Kingdom and European Union. That didn't happen. Greg makes the point that uh, there are now more licensing uh, procedures in place, uh, more uh, manufacturing agreements in place. Uh, is that going to make a difference? Yes, but that's now, two years later. And the WHO plan was clear and clear can be, which was we will immunise, we will immunise targeted people simultaneously all over the world. And if we had immunised people in according to that plan, we would be in a better place today. Instead, what has happened is we have immunized and then boosted and then boosted again. And then finally, Africa and other parts of the world are now starting to get the vaccines. But the trouble is that induces a what we would call a sine wave situation, a yo-yo, meaning whilst we are immunized, our immunity fades, so we take boosters and the Africans are only just kicking off. It would have been much, much, much better to have come down together, together, targeted immunization across the globe simultaneously. We didn't do this. Uh, Mocha, I know that you have been very publicly critical of the rich G7 countries for not doing more to uh, force drug companies to share their vaccine technology and not do more to make sure that low-income countries uh, get more vaccines. What do you want to see happen? We basically want to reverse the current situation of vaccine apartheid, which was um, the result of a combination of rich countries allowing pharmaceutical companies the total monopoly on production, yes. on distribution, and on price. Um, and actually, to say, just to, to reply first to what Craig, Greg said, um, to say that, you know, COVAX, uh, that the companies are, are putting the vaccines and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and it's India that stopped the vaccinated, vaccinating Africa. It's actually not true because it's, Sorry. it's, it's um, it, you know, anybody, anybody who works, you don't need to a degree even to understand that you can't rely on one company, AstraZeneca, yes. and one company, Serum, to produce enough vaccines for everybody. It's just you can't do that. So, so you because want... there is, there is simple, something simple, which is sometimes you have production problems, like what happened with Johnson & Johnson. It doesn't have to be banning export like India did. Other things can happen, and then you don't have doses. And that's what happened. Pfizer and yes. Moderna did not discover Africa, except when President Biden said that he would buy a million doses. And before that, they totally ignored Africa. Now yes. they talk about Africa because of the pressure. And the, the, even now, when they say they're going to um, help Africa All to right. manufacture, they're going, they bypassing what Africa is doing, which well, is the mRNA hub in South Africa. Let, let, me give, let me give Greg a chance to answer uh, one of the points that um, Bharat uh, has brought up, this, uh, this criticism that... Um, wealthy countries bought up all the doses at the beginning of the pandemic, so there simply weren't any left over for uh, yes. developing countries. Um, Greg, what, what would you say to that? Well, I don't think that's completely true. I, th I, I think we've got to bear in mind a couple of things. Firstly, um, through the licensing agreement that AstraZeneca had with the Serum Institute, um, the first uh, COVAX arrival anywhere on the planet was in Ghana. 
And that was three months, less than three months after uh, the vaccine was being distributed, the AZ vaccine was being distributed uh, in Great Britain. Now, this is historical, less than three months uh, that it was being distributed in the UK, which in itself, uh, like Europe, was like an epi epicenter of the pandemic. Yeah, uh, that was happening and that was going to continue happening. Now, and I'm, had we not had certain pandemic crises elsewhere uh, where the products were being produced, um, we would have had a situation where this idea of the, the total equality would have taken place. So we do have to revisit that. And I think this is why there is a very big case um, of looking at global distribution of, of manufacturing. The thing is that not all companies can do this and not even in Africa. And we're working and companies individually are working with governments to build up that manufacturing base in Africa so as we can have better health security uh, for the region. Uh, and the second thing, yeah, the, the models were being set up as the pandemic was going on. And we, we, we established licensing agreements um, bilaterally with companies because we're working in a pandemic. We have to work extremely quickly. We had to do due diligence. Uh, and we, we operated using those structures that were there. And then also bear in mind, it, it's absolutely essential we have vaccine equity. It's not enough what is being done in developing countries. Not all of them. There, there are figures where can even match the US, but certainly in, 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 in certain parts of Africa. But let's remember that, that Europe, for example, was, in, was the epicenter of the pandemic. And it, the, the governments were reacting very quickly. And then the third thing I, want, I do want to mention, there is a parallel between um, the lack of delivery or access in certain countries with weaknesses in healthcare systems. And I think this pandemic has um, exposed those weaknesses and the importance of trying to have greater investment in healthcare structures, because that that is where there are significant problems. We've got four, I think it's 400 um, million d doses coming through COVAX at the moment. I'm not sure the exact figures, but there is a big absorption problem. COVAX can't distribute them because there are absorption problems. Okay, in well, let, let's, let's, let's put that to it. So go ahead, Mugger. Uh, well, I mean, absorption problem. So the first 10 months of last year, there was drops going to Africa. Yes, Ghana. And it was like a big media thing about it. And then there was really little drops going to the countries. Yes. So it was so difficult. So if you compare it with the UK, you have adverts everywhere about go and get vaccinated. So yes, if I go, Mugga, I will get vaccinated. There, were there Africa. other issues that, that had to be taken account of? For example, um, storage issues, because... Um, some of these vaccines are thermally unstable um, unless they're at very, very low temperatures. So things like that and getting getting them to, to remote areas, are, are those not things that had to be worked out as the pandemic progressed? Okay, let's put... Okay, let's put, of course, you have to take that into account, but let's let's just put some, some context to that. The beginning of the pandemic, if we had this vaccine, the majority of people who were infected were in capital cities. And in the capital cities, in tertiary hospitals, you could have had these um, boxes of, of special um, cooling and uh, store the vaccines. That didn't happen. You couldn't. Right. You could have the governments. The governments in Africa, they didn't know what vaccine is coming, when, how yeah. many doses. So they didn't know. How do you prepare for the unknown? You do, you have no idea what's okay, coming but, to you. Barra, th and, this and issue... there was no sign. There was no sign that Pfizer or Moderna are interested. So how how can they spend in preparing storage when they don't but know if it's coming? It is the it case though that, that, that the, the pandemic has certainly exposed weaknesses in in health systems, particularly yes. in in developing countries. Barrett, would you say how big a part would you say that played? Uh, in trying to get people vaccinated. I mean, we also heard about things like um, vaccines being flushed down the drain in some African countries sure. because um, they'd come to their, their uh, end of their shelf life. So we, we know what we know, and that's a constant, which is that uh, poorer nations have poor logistics and poor infrastructure. We know that, right? But we mustn't create a... a, a a get out of jail card by saying because they had all these problems we didn't do well enough you basically the pharmaceutical companies the Pfizer's the Moderna's of this world they developed the vaccines through public funding they got the technology through public adventure 
And then when they were successful with their vaccines, they sold it to the best, biggest bidders. They did what they did. Thereafter, and it is only thereafter, that the AstraZeneca Care of Serum Institute India, etc., have now started to arrive in Africa. But a wrong has been done, and we need to acknowledge that, yes, the Pfizer's and the Moderna's of this world ought to have said, we are sending X million doses to you at this time, get ready, get your refrigeration in place, etc. And it could have been done. There was no vaccines available. So how can the African countries even prepare for it? OK, let's take a look at whether the Global South could produce safe and efficient vaccines uh, if it was given the opportunity. So a South African laboratory, Afrogen, has become the first to produce uh, an mRNA vaccine candidate on the African continent. It's also the first to be based on an existing vaccine without the help or the approval of the original manufacturer, in this case, Moderna. Uh, this is what the head of the Medicines Patent Pool organisation had to say. If this project shows that Africa can take cutting-edge technology and produce cutting-edge products with it, that will banish this idea, Africa can't do it. And I hope that will really change the global mindset around Africa. Greg, I'm really interested to hear uh, your view uh, on this because you were the former head of the uh, medicines patent pool, which has championed the Afrogen project. How do pharma companies view the prospect of their vaccines being copied? Good. Well, what is happening with the mRNA hub is, is, is one model. It's one, it's one option. I should say that the, the, the first agreement that took place in Africa was actually between J&J &J and Aspen for fill and finish, and that is now extended for, to a, fuel, uh, a full IP uh, transfer and technology transfer um, for, the, for the full production. And we've seen other uh, examples taking place as well. And, and only yesterday was released uh, the BioNTech uh, initiative in, in, several, uh, in several African countries. So there are different types of models that are available. And I think from the industry point of view, um, it is always a question of, you know, doing this voluntarily, doing this in partnership and, and working with companies uh, in which you can transfer technologies and have the skill sets. So that is certainly the preference of, of, of the industry to work on that. Now, when it, when it comes to the medicines patent pool, should, should just emphasize there are two agreements that pharmaceutical companies have made uh, with the medicines patent pool for treatments, um, where there is, of course, a, a pre-existing um, relationship between the industry and the medicines patent pool on, on like small molecules for HIV. And uh, very much welcome that that has taken place. There's also a third uh, uh, multi-bilateral agreement as well. So all three treatments that are for, for, um, for uh, COVID have been through licensing agreements, either through the medicines patent pool or bilaterally. But there's, there's no patent waiver, though. I mean, this is something that the, uh, the WTO yeah. has been um, stuck on, uh, trying to get through some kind of waiver which will allow other countries to make their own versions of vaccines. And that's been very heavily resisted by yeah. uh, high-income countries and, and, and pharmaceutical companies. That, that's correct, isn't it? That, that, that's correct. And, and, and where the industry comes from is from, from two sides, really. One is that... A patent waiver, an IP waiver in itself, would, would, would do very little. What, what, what is important is being able to, to have te transfer and with companies that can actually absorb and work. And that's what the industry has been doing, working on well over, I think it's 340 agreements, about 90% about of them involve licensing and tech technical agreements. These have all been, of course, bilateral. They've been, we had to do due diligence and you know, we had to work under the pressures of the pandemic. So that's, that's one way okay. in which the, the industry has been doing it. All right, so let me put can this can to the other. To... So the point is that IP waivers are useless and, and without the ability of other laboratories in other parts of the world to be able to produce these vaccines. What do you say to that, Moga? Well, first of all, I just want to correct a couple of things. Yes, Johnson & Johnson had an agreement with Aspen in South Africa. It was for, for fill and finish, the final yes. stages, despite Aspen said they can make it if they have the technology. That's the first thing. The second thing about this one, that the doses that were made in South Africa at the height of the beta variant were shipped to, to, to Europe. So that's how Johnson & Johnson treat Africa. It was only because yeah. South African civil society created a global 
campaign against it that Johnson Johnson said, well, okay, we're not going to export from. So that's just one thing to show you. The other thing is, you, Greg, you said that industry likes to work voluntary, on a voluntary basis. Well, great. The mRNA hub, when it was launched, WHO said, companies, please come and share technology. Nobody answered yet. Nobody. They went parallel. They wouldn't share with what Africa wanted. So, so don't, don't, don't say that industry has done its bit. It hasn't. Actually, industry blocked um, the, te the technology from reaching uh, Africa. And now there is mRNA research happening in other countries, you know, in Thailand, in South Korea, in China, in others. And th th that secret is going to be broken. Maybe not today, maybe not for COVID, uh, for this current crisis of COVID. By, but certainly for the future of COVID. Right, well, but it would have been better if companies shared the technology and then it become really a good partnership and really a good intention of helping Africa. So, I mean, so this is key, injury. isn't it? Technology transfer, because um, yeah. yes. the, the, these laboratories need to be able to make these uh, yeah. vaccines safely and efficiently. Uh, Barrett, what's your view on uh, on laboratories like Afrogen in, in South Africa are now beginning to, to manufacture their own versions of vaccines. I, I am filled with I'm filled with pride and happiness. And the reason why I'm filled with pride and happiness is Africa has created it, succeeded despite despite all the obstacles that were put in their way, as Moga has just said. And why I'm so pleased and thrilled is as a result of them succeeding, I foresee them also making vaccines for things that we have not done before, such as better, better vaccines for, um, for tuberculosis, malaria, dengue fever, and other infections where the antibiotics are now failing. And I am so pleased that the monopoly of mRNA vaccines is not residing only with Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. Will people trust those vaccines if they're not, Why not? Res residing there with the big be companies? Well, because there trust in be vaccines is a big issue, properly. isn't it? Sorry. No, trust the vaccines will be trialed. It's not like just because it's made in Africa, you don't trust it. There are international protocols to uh, try and test any vaccine, and that's what will be done. OK, let's very quickly just look at the, uh, the way ho forward, because COVID is obviously here to stay. Um, very quickly through all my guests. Um, Greg, what needs to happen to ensure vaccine equity? Well, I think, f firstly, is to ensure that we have a, a proper international mechanism. You know, Co COVAX was, um, you know, at the start of it, we need to build on something like that for future pandemics, and in in including in the existing pandemic, as you say, it won't go away. Another thing, we do have to look at health security and where, uh, where manufacturing is made. And uh, I can assure you, there's a large number of us in the industry that completely share that, that desire. And uh, I'm here at the African the European African Business Forum. We've made a declaration. We're, we're working on partnership. We want to look at sustainable long-term um, vaccine and treatment production in Africa. Um, and that has a lot of dimensions to it. I'll take another, uh, another show. I'm sure we, could, we can do that. But yes, it, it's the proper international structure uh, and it's about health security and it's about financing as well and health structures. Greg, thank you. Mogo, what do you want to see from, from governments and drug companies? We went diversifying production all over the world and maximizing it. And that means sharing technology. So if there is a pandemic, then it should technology that we paid for as taxpayers should be shared and waiving intellectual property. And when we say intellectual property rules, we're not talking about patents only. We're talking about trade secrets, which is basically the data and the know-how. This is really critical for technology transfer. So we so we want sharing technology, waiving IP, investing in manufacturing, and then finally investing in health system. Thank you. And Barrett, what more has to be done to ensure that, you know, anywhere that you are in the world, you are going to have access to a supply of vaccines? So, so this pandemic has highlighted that promises are meaningless. So whilst I do... Uh, believe, Greg, that the intentions are there, I do not have faith in the pharmaceutical companies to deliver on their promises. So I would like to say, 
promises alone, agreements alone, memorandums of understanding alone are not worth the paper they're written on. What I want is deliver the goods, enable the manufacturing capacity, enable it to be made in regions of the world. So just saying we have memorandums of understanding which can be torn up in the middle of a pandemic and then they say, but we were in the middle of a crisis, that's why we did this and that, is not good enough. We, we, we need concrete substances put in place so that this is not repeated again. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. Some really uh, fascinating views there, and I think we covered a lot of ground. Great to get your opinions. Uh, Greg, thank you, Moga and Bharat. And don't forget, you can see more of our discussions and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and all the team here and our guests, bye-bye, and thanks for watching.